Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Star Wars video. This is going to be my review for The Mandalorian Season 2, Episode 5, otherwise known as Chapter 13, The Jedi. So, this was obviously set up to be a hyped episode, uh, knowing that it was called The Jedi, directed by Dave Filoni, the setup of the story, this has to be the Ahsoka debut episode, and it was. So, Ahsoka makes her live-action debut in Star Wars, and in my mind, it really, really delivered. Um, this was a really exciting, kind of monumental moment for me for just Star Wars, I suppose. Seeing one of the most popular characters in the franchise make this massive leap, and now be a character who a, a lot of the people who maybe won't even watch the Clone Wars or watch Rebels discover this character for potentially the first time and may now go back and discover the setup for this character from the Clone Wars and Rebels. That was really, really cool to just sort of, you know, th this character who like I've followed on her full journey and now she makes this, you know, big, big jump into the spotlight in The Mandalorian once more knowing that like I've seen that full journey that's was very cool to see and what I liked about just f w w regards to this big reveal in the episode I like that they were straight away up front boom here's Ahsoka right at the start she gets to sort of intro section all to herself to highlight that she's an important enough character that she's not just going to be here because the Mandalorian story requires her to be here she's got her own stuff going on and as we'll get into during this discussion, they seem to be very much setting up the idea that, like, yeah, she she has her own plot going on that I don't really think the whole Admiral Thrawn stuff is going to necessarily be a plot point of this show particularly. I think they'll reference stuff around it, but I don't think this show is necessarily going to be where we see Ahsoka trying to find Thrawn. Um, but that is a very cool setup to finally have, you know, them coming back to that story that we, you know, haven't seen anything on in quite a while. Since the end of Rebels, we have not come back to Ahsoka's quest with Sabine to try and find Ezra, and I suppose with that now, Thrawn. My guess is that she's trying to find Thrawn to find Ezra, but it could also be the other way around because this implies that Thrawn is now active again, I would guess. And that implies quite a lot about sort of his role in the Empire now um, and where we are given that we're post episode 6. Um, we're sort of almost waiting to see the transition from the Empire to the First Order. So there's a lot of like very interesting stuff set up with just the, like, here's Ahsoka's plot. And, I, and, and in the same way that I don't necessarily think this is the show that is going to, like, super heavily cover, like, Bo-Katan trying to win Mandalore back, I think, you know, we'll see Ahsoka again in The Mandalorian. I think we'll see Bo-Katan again in The Mandalorian. But I don't think the show is suddenly going to switch over to being about those two characters necessarily. Um in that the setup seems to be that maybe the Mandalorian will need to find Ahsoka again after he visits the planet Tython, um, and that Bo-Katan is going to come back into the story because she is connected to the Darksaber and Gideon in the same way that like Gideon is now tracking the Mandalorian and the child. So that was great to see. And then, okay, cool, we got to see Ahsoka straight away. How long is it going to take the Mandalorian to actually interact with Ahsoka? And I, again, I really appreciated that that within 15 minutes of the episode, we'd gotten over any sort of animosity, and boom, he says what he says to her about like Bo-Katan sent me, and she's interested in talking because she sees a baby Yoda in front of her, basically. So. That was fun. I really appreciated that they gave us a little tease of a fight, just a few second sequence getting to see like a, you know, our main character here against one of the more skilled uh, combatants we've kind of seen, Ahsoka versus the Mandalorian. Really fun to see that sort of bounty hunter skill set up against the skill set of a force wielding Jedi. Um, just very cool. And, and in in general. 
like the choreography through for Ahsoka throughout this I thought was very good. Ahsoka uses two lightsabers. They're her white lightsabers, of course, at this point, um, which it, it is funny to just track like Ahsoka's lightsabers colors in terms of like green at the start, then she switches to blue, um, then they then she gets the the white lightsabers. Um, it's just fun to track all of that, and you know the the white definitely is is unique at that. We now in this show the two lightsabers we've seen white lightsabers and the black lightsaber the dark saber so um it, it feels like you know a lot of this episode was you know setting up like putting pieces into place like the mandalorian gets a beskar sp spear within this episode a weapon that within this episode we see is capable of blocking and defending and attacking against a lightsaber setting up the idea of like when Moff Gideon faces the Mandalorian one on one, how is um, the Mandalorian going to defend against lightsabers? So straight away they confirm Beskar is immune to lightsabers; it can block lightsabers. I suppose, you know, I suppose they got across the idea here that pure Beskar is a is a like complete block for lightsabers, and if you only use, I suppose, a bit of it, it makes it sort of lightsaber resistant, but not full on like it blocks it. So now we see that, okay, the Mandalorian not only has a defense, but a way to attack against uh, Moff Gideon when I suppose they eventually have their showdown. So that was um, good to see. Also, with regards to history, it, it helps to kind of clarify that once again, like, okay, here's how the Mandalorians were able to face and be a threat to the Jedi in the past. That I think in the old EU, they, they it was like Mandalorian iron or something like that, but it's Beskar in the in the current canon. So that's cool that you add that to the a few other materials we know of that are like lightsaber resistant or immune. Uh, I think the Magna Guard staffs are made out of, was it, is it Frick? I, the PH or IK or whatever it's called, that's what their um, uh, staffs are made out of. And then I think that when electrified makes it, like, it able to block lightsabers, which is why they were able to do that. And then Cortosis, I, I don't know if it's even canon anymore, but that was previously a thing uh, for defending against light, lightsaber strikes. So that's that's all I think really, really cool. So yeah. We're talking about Ahsoka here. So, uh, Ahsoka played by Rosario Dawson. Uh, I think we'd known this for quite a while at this point. I thought the 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 look fit Ahsoka really well. I was a bit worried, as I think I talked about like a few episodes ago of, of my reviews here, that typically the Togruta look in the movies hasn't been like amazing. And like Ahsoka is a character who you have to get right. This can't just look okay. It has to look like really good. And in my mind, they got it right. They didn't go overboard to make her look like too alien. Thankfully, of course, like a lot of the like there there are species in Star Wars that are mainly humanoid with a little bit of a twist. And so Zabrak is one of them. Tagruta is another. And I think it worked here that they managed to make the, the head tails look really nice and the, the orange for her skin and stuff like that worked. White markings, really, really uh, well done. And I think after like the first like couple of lines of dialogue, I immediately got over that it wasn't Ashley Eckstein speaking. And it was just like, yes, this is older Ahsoka. This makes complete sense. And so that worked and it definitely felt like the character based on the way she's like portrayed in Rebels when we last see her when she's kind of uh, older and I, I think that uh, definitely works and in terms of like the, the physicality of the role like uh, obviously I don't know how much of the, the stunt work Rosario Dawson did versus the stunt double but it looked really really good of course they weren't going like crazy overboard with the acrobatics but they included a little bit of it to get that across and um, that you know, Jedi can use force assisted abilities and you had moments like the the one-on-one -on -one fight between Ahsoka and the Magistrate which uh, was it the the absolute peak of you know choreography 
not necessarily, but it was a relatively, I think, realistic fight of, you know, both of them being pretty cautious against each other, and they were on a pretty, like, flat ground, and so they were having pretty much just a straight up, you know, pretty fair fight where didn't really feel like any of them were doing anything particularly crazy, they're just going for their skill with their melee weapons against each other. Uh, and so, you know, Ahsoka loses one of her lightsabers, but then she comes back with just the one. And um, I thought that was a, a pretty solid way to do it, to at least get across that, oh, this person she's been hunting is actually a little bit of a threat. She has a weapon that can block lightsabers, and she's skilled enough to use it to uh, some effect. But uh, ultimately, Ahsoka won that fight in the end. That was pretty solid in my mind. Um, so... Yeah, the, the, the reveal we get here is that, okay, she, she's one, she's trying to help this town because the magistrate is like torturing people. But the main thing she wants is the information. Where is your master? Where is Grand Admiral Thrawn? So Thrawn is a chiss uh, from Star Wars Rebels, I suppose, primarily. But uh, if you've read the old EU, he's like the star of a lot of the early Star Wars expanded universe novels. The, the first few that came out. And he actually is quite heavily covered in the new canon. He has like, what is it at this point? Like four books, I think it is. Like three to cover sort of like his um, his origin story to set up Rebels. He's obviously in Star Wars Rebels. And now he's recently, we're getting a, a sort of prequel series with him. To set up the whole Chiss Ascendancy plot line, which... I've been kind of waiting to see if they'll ever finally bring that into play in anything beyond the books or the comics. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but my guess is probably that Thrawn, if he has returned from wherever Ezra sort of had him sent at the end of Rebels, is probably the guy who would make the most sense to be in charge of what is left of the Empire. Because I, I get the impression that there is still decent bit of the Empire left, which is why, like, we got the plot of, like, say, last week's episode, uh, you know, shutting down an Empire base on a specific planet. Um, so, it, it's hard to tell, like, is he doing his own thing now, or what, what is his actual connection to this magistrate person? I'm not particularly sure. At the same time, like I said, I'm not particularly sure that The Mandalorian is necessarily going to be the show where we necessarily see Thrawn make a, a live-action debut as well. Um, but I think he's, he would be a very cool character to introduce because he is so well-defined uh, through the amount of novels and stuff like that we have of just the really intelligent planner character who is sort of like a, a Sherlock Holmes-esque character of the Star Wars universe. He's such an impressive tactician but not so good politically. Let's let's see what they do with that. Um, and then if they do go for like a, a separate series, I guess this is how we reintroduce Ezra into things, who, if it's not going to be Ahsoka who trains him, and they maybe might not want to have the child train under Luke, reintroducing Ezra to potentially train him kind of fits, because like Ezra in Rebels had sort of a connection with Yoda and I don't know how what that necessarily means for like you know him just interacting with another member of the species but you know Ezra was kind of important at the end of Rebels and if they do get him back into play that's something to do with him as like a surviving you know force sensitive character that we don't know of too many from this kind of era so a lot of really really interesting things to consider here um but, uh, yeah, uh, I suppose the, the actual, like, plot of the episode is, like, okay, the, the Mandalorian arrives on the planet, of course, following Bo-Katan's orders. He is then hired to deal with Ahsoka, because the town he goes to is the Magistrate's town. But, but obviously, he just uses that as basically a tip for where to find Ahsoka, and they then work together to free the town from the, the terrible control of the Magistrate. And I like the team-up in that... You know, they both they acknowledge that like no one will expect a Mandalorian to team up with a Jedi and it'll give us the edge, which it absolutely did. I like the cleverness of the plan of like you know, he 
no one would ever suspect, you know, feigning giving armor away from a Mandalorian, so her throwing down one of his pauldrons was like proof that she had killed him. But it was just a very clever ploy, and he, he had the pauldron back pretty quickly. But him arriving out of nowhere to save the people from being executed, to allow Ahsoka to have her fight with the Magistrate, was really, really cool. Now, the standoff between him and the Captain of the Guard, I didn't think was the most, like, exciting thing. Because I don't felt that, I didn't feel like they set up that character all that well, that he was a big threat. It felt like the gimmick that they went for with that character was that, oh, he has like a blaster shotgun, a uh, scatter gun, whatever, whatever way you want to call it. That was the main uniqueness of him, is that he has this unique blaster. And it's like, oh, look, I'm putting it down, I'm putting it down. Secret gun, but the Mandalorian's quicker on the draw. That, that was basically it. Um, in, in that sense, you know, the, the action of the episode, of course, the focus was on Ahsoka of like, you know, first Jedi action really within the series it made sense you kind of had to do that to allow you know it was primarily her plot here the Mandalorian's plot was just finding and inter interacting with Ahsoka Ahsoka had her own stuff going on but for the Mandalorian the focus was definitely on the scenes with the child who the big thing with the child in this episode is that we get sort of his backstory as well as his name so the child is named uh, Grogu, if I remember correctly, um, and she learns this basically through communing with him through the Force. They sort of just sit next to each other and just sort of connect with each other, and this is where she gets that information from. As far as I'm aware, it was a little bit kind of weird in the sense that I didn't get the impression that this was Ahsoka being like, oh yeah, like we both trained at the Jedi Temple at the same time, so... I actually know him from there. Based on the way she was talking, it was like she didn't actually know that this was a thing and this is her also figuring it out for the first time of like, okay, she sort of could sense sort of his history through their connection. That he has trained under, under multiple masters at the Jedi Temple, which is why he knows how to use the Force. Again, he's 50 years old. This fits that he was around back in the prequel era of course like we're we're not too far after episode six here so this is still well well within range that the the the, the child Grogu could have been training for much much longer than Ahsoka obviously it pretty much I suppose clarifies to us that um this this species just develops much slower than other species which is how they um live to, to so, such a advanced ages so that that was cool ahsoka also says that um the only other member of his kind that she's met before is yoda and she obviously says uh, a jedi master called yoda which brings up the question of like so does, so does that mean that uh, ahsoka has never met yaddle or like she, she could theoretically know about yaddle but have never met her yaddle obviously was on the Jedi Council in episode one. And I, I don't know the specific timeline on this with regards to like, okay, when Anakin came in and then started his training at the end of episode one, how does that timeline wise fit in with when Plo Koon found Ahsoka? Because Anakin isn't that much older than Ahsoka in the sense that like Anakin is only like, I think 21 in episode 3, so 21 when he turns basically into Darth Vader, roughly, I, I think that's the, the correct case, because yeah, I think he's 8 in episode 1, 10 years passes to episode 2, and he's 18, then 3 years pass going into episode 3, so yeah, 21, and then Ahsoka is like 16, so I suppose 16, potentially 17, so yeah, the age difference between Anakin and Ahsoka is only like 4 or 5 years, meaning she would have been like, three or four when Anakin kind of came in to train which could have could have fit in with Plo Koon actually fi finding her and training her at this point so you know she could have been at the temple at that point meaning that she probably should have known Yaddle even if we say that maybe that happened a little bit later that shortly after episode one Yaddle steps down from the council or is killed or whatever um she should at least know about Yaddle so that's maybe a little bit of a like you know are we forgetting about episode one, Yaddle being on the council? 
and the timeline of that Ahsoka, like, really should know her. But, okay, I get it. I get it. Yoda's obviously the main member of that species. Yeah, it all doesn't particularly matter, I guess. But I guess it confirms that Grogu is not like the child of Yoda and Yaddle or is not related to those two particularly. That's... I feel that like Ahsoka maybe would have known if that was the case. So I guess this kind of confirms that he is just a separate member of that species, which I kind of like that it's just like you don't have to inherently link him to the only other members of the species that we know about. Um, but the other key thing she says is that he was taken from the temple right as the Empire came to power. So they're, they're basically saying, here is how he, as someone who was training in the temple, avoided Order 66, which is that someone took him off world to avoid that. And that makes a lot of sense because he would have had to avoid probably the most thorough part of Order 66, which was Anakin leading the attack on the Jedi Temple. They, there's no way, like, they... they anyone would have got through that. So, did a specific Jedi Master take him off world or or what? Like, wh it, it seems to be setting up that maybe we might get a flashback of Grogu and how he survived. Because it feels like we, we have to connect a few dots from how he went from surviving that and potentially being protected by a Master for a certain point after Order 66 to coming into possession of the Empire and being used for his blood to fuel the exper the experiments of the Empire. Um, so they also established that like, he has purposefully made the decision to not really use his force powers that much, which establishes that it's kind of interesting that he ends up using them quite a lot around the Mandalorian, and it's because he trusts the Mandalorian. Now. He sees the Mandalorian as his father figure, and he has an attachment to him, a trust, and in a way, that is sort of the problem. That's the problem that Ahsoka has, why she refuses to train him, is that because he has this sort of emotional connection with the Mandalorian and that he seems to only want to use his powers to, like, protect the Mandalorian or when the Mandalorian tells him to use them, that's maybe not the best maybe attitude to have with the Force and that she knows all too well what happened when when a Jedi falls while having those sort of attachments. Um, and I kind of like, in a way, that they didn't, in this episode, directly state, I am the Padawan of Anakin Skywalker. So that, like, if you haven't... If you don't know who Ahsoka is, if you've only watched, like, the movies and are now watching The Mandalorian because it's, like, live-action Star Wars and you don't know Ahsoka from The Clone Wars or Rebels... I'd, I'd love to know what the reaction is to Ahsoka. In that, like, okay, she's a Jedi. She must have survived Order 66. They, they're the takeaways in the fact that they mention, you know, the fall of the Jedi Order and stuff like that. And that she, she acknowledges that in the episode. But the, the reference is clearly to Anakin when she says that. And I like that there's something there for those who know. But then for people who don't know, like, that could potentially be a big reveal if like in maybe this show or if they do have maybe an Ahsoka live action show as another show that happens when in live action they finally make that reveal that that could be like just as kind of uh, interesting but um yeah I, I kind of like the the restraint there that there is no need to just with Ahsoka just be like here's my whole history um but it's it's fun to just know that oh yeah, this informs quite a lot that Ahsoka in the Clone Wars, sort of the last sort of new content with her that we saw, she didn't consider herself a Jedi. And, you know, she just survives Order 66. We, see, we saw how that happens, where she is at the end of that series. We see her make her, like, obviously return later on in Rebels. And then most recently, the most new scene at the end of Star Wars Rebels with her, which I'm guessing is kind of the piece of content that happens, like, just before we encounter Ahsoka here, which is Sabine and Ahsoka are theoretically going to work together to try and find Ezra because he hyperspaced himself and thrown away at the end of the big battle at the end of Star Wars Rebels. So that seems to be the, the, the setup here of, like, Thrawn 
can only be back in action if he has returned from where he was uh, with Ezra. Now, if they want to link the Thrawn books into play, they can always establish that Ezra hyperspaced them out into, like, you know, beyond the Outer Rim, the, um, what's it called, the, it's, oh, what, why do I not remember this, um, uh, expand, expanded territory or something like that, uh, either way, the, like, unexplored space, basically, um, wild space or whatever you want, whatever you want to call it, the, the stuff that isn't mapped within, sort of, like, the Galactic Republic or Empire and so on, the Chiss are from that space and so the early stuff with Thrawn is him sort of getting used to being part of the sort of mapped galaxy and the fact that like it's like a whole separate kind of thing so if in like their opinion Ezra and Thrawn went off the map that would actually be an area that maybe Thrawn knows about so if they bring more of the Chiss into play that's a reason for like how Thrawn could have regained a foothold again and you know, Ezra might be with the Chiss or whatever. That 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 could be a cool plot point. But again, I'm not sure if that's going to be a Mandalorian plot. I get more the impression that like we'll probably get a few more live action Star Wars shows announced as the the years pass, and Thrawn might be the the star of one of them. That maybe involves Ahsoka and some of the other characters as well. Um, so that was cool. Um, but yeah, l lots of fun scenes here of just like coming back to the uh, control kind of uh, lever knob that uh, um, Grogu likes so much and that he doesn't want to levitate the rock, but he will do it to get that uh, item that he likes so much. And e equally just the fact that like Ahsoka wants to do a little bit of force training with him, but he won't do it for her, but he will for the Mandalorian. That was just a nice moment to show that once again, like, oh... That's cool that you have this connection, but it's also maybe not the best for going into official Jedi training. So, just the 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 idea, I suppose, simple plot of Ahsoka is going to take and train the child going forward. That seems to be out of the picture. So, the setup now is that Ahsoka has told the Mandalorian to take the child to Tython. And on Tython, he will... Did he, say, did he mention something about a mountain? Or it's, it's something like it's on the top of the temple. That the seeing stone, if he uses the force on the stone or near the stone, it will reveal to Rogu what his future is. Now, Tython, if I remember correctly from the old EU, is the planet where a pretty major battle in the Darth Bane books happens. Uh, it's quite heavily used within those books, um, and it, it's I think it's in general important in the old EU. I don't know if it's actually been mentioned at all in like the the new canon, but I suppose this is potentially the first one, and it makes sense. The Jedi Temple on Tython that was basically the situation before, and we're going to see this new Seeing Stone thing, which is going to reveal the um, the I suppose death, the destiny, the path that uh, the child, Baby Yoda, Grogu, should take. And the question is going to be, is his future to be with the Mandalorian going forward, or is it to, at some point, become like a, a Jedi or a Force user? They also set up the idea that if he does that, it will alert other Jedi who have survived to his presence, and they may come and find him. That's interesting in that the other characters are just, are, like I said, we're like, Luke Skywalker obviously is the obvious one, but would they bring Luke into this show? I'm not sure. That maybe seems like going to a bit like to bring all the main characters in. Ezra is the other character you could maybe think of. Like, again, it's kind of weird. Like, is he a master? Is he the right character to potentially train someone like this? I'm not sure, but it's... It's potentially a way to maybe guide Ezra maybe back into the story if you wanted to do it that way. And then I'm, I'm really blanking on if there are any other Jedi out there at this point. I'm, like, I'm guessing Lucas found his first few recruits. So there are other Jedi, or it's like the very start of uh, Luke's new Jedi Order. Um, but I don't know if any of the other characters would have um, necessarily survived to this point. 
I'm probably forgetting someone really, really obvious, but uh, that's just where I'm at, I suppose, trying to think about this. Um, but still, like, this episode overall, I thought was super interesting. Uh, this was the big episode probably we've been waiting for since the start, which was finally to learn a relatively substantial amount of information out about Baby Yoda. So now knowing his name, so we can stop calling him the child or Baby Yoda, great. Uh, and then also the core backstory being that he's not just like a random member of Yoda's species who they all happen to use the force and it's just inherent to them but no he he was on he was in the jedi temple on Coruscant. like he was part of the jedi order for a good amount of his life that was very interesting to learn that i didn't think they'd actually go for so that was actually very substantial to hear that and to more or less set up like a little bit of a mystery of like how did he Survive Order 66. How did he get off Coruscant and survive into this era? And who helped him to do that? That potentially isn't around anymore. That maybe someone, that person was found out by like Inquisitors or whatever. Um, and that was why Baby Yoda had to then stop using his, his powers to go sort of undercover. And was eventually found at a certain point by the Empire. There's, there's a lot of story to come together here. But uh, we're, we're on our way to Tython next, and then the open plot threads from other episodes are still that uh, Gideon has a tracker on the Mandalorian ship, so Gideon is going to come into contact with them at some point. He's going to make his, I suppose, proper debut in the show at some point this season. And the other thing would be the Boba Fett tease from the first episode of this season. They haven't come back to that yet. I don't even know what necessarily that's going to be about in that as far as we were aware the Mandalorian still has his armor on his ship. I don't like I don't know if Boba Fett has tracking on him so I don't know how they're going to come back into contact with each other at all and um, that that's very like out there to me what exactly that they're going to do with that Um very like confused about that again. I, I half feel that a lot of the, the teases of like other characters in The Mandalorian are less teases of like plots for The Mandalorian the show and more are openings for spin-offs for other live action shows. I really feel like that's a huge opportunity in that I I don't really picture us getting too many movies going into the future after the sequels given how well The Mandalorian is doing, so I really do feel like the future of Star Wars is in live-action shows. Obi-Wan one is coming, the what, the Cassian Andor one I have big questions about, but I guess we'll be okay when it comes out. And they're likely probably going to do some more. So that's going to be fun to, to see what happens. But um, yeah, long review here, but it probably was the most interesting, one of the more substantial episodes of The Mandalorian, so a lot to talk about. So there are my thoughts on the episode in the comments, let me know what your thoughts were, but that's been the video, thanks for watching, and bye.